Let him begin in a prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your church. We thank you for the gift of unity, for a place to gather where we receive you in Holy Communion. We thank you for that gift of the Eucharist, for your Son Jesus, for the sacrifice he made so that we may have salvation and be with you forever in heaven. May we keep that death and that eternal life ever before us so that we may always strive to live holy lives. And may your grace always guide us and may we never be separated from you. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So as we get started, I just kind of a, a quick kind of... Uh, note about kind of the the way that we're we're doing this class it's it's going to be a, a little bit different in that uh, my goal is to provide more of a big picture as opposed to here's all the 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 scriptural uh, uh, the scriptural evidence for the church here's all the scripture passages where we can draw evidence for apostolic succession for the primacy of Peter for all these different things um, because I could just read those off to you, uh, and then we could do a study based on those. So if you're looking for those, I have plenty of uh, kind of accessories, if you want, uh, uh, up here that can give you those scriptural references. Um, but where those scriptural references fit in is kind of this big picture which I want to draw, uh, namely, uh, what is the church, uh, what is her purpose, uh, uh, how is she established, uh, is she necessary? And so uh, that's kind of so. So when I when I do go through some of the scriptures, know that it is nowhere near exhaustive. Um, that is not my my intention to give you this exhaustive list list of scriptural references to the church and all the different aspects of it. Um, that could take up an entire whole different uh, class of just doing that. Um, but what, kind of what I want to do is just provide kind of a big picture. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll do a quick review of last time um, where we covered uh, kind of from the beginning, from creation uh, uh, to the book of Acts, to that conversion story of St. Paul. Um, and then uh, uh, tonight we're going to cover, namely, uh, uh, going through quickly the book of Acts and then going into the early church, uh, not even to the year 200. Uh, and then Next week, we'll do the last 1,800 years. <laughs> Abbreviated, obviously. Um, uh, so, to, to review from last time, we can summarize uh, what, we, what we covered last time. So, if you missed last time, here's the, foot, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the quick notes uh, for it. So, from last time, we began with creation that creation is a, a, is a place that God created for man to be with God. That was his in, initial plan. That Adam and Eve uh, were created in the image of God. Uh, they were created in the likeness of God. And it said that you know, Adam walked with God in the cool of the evening. That creation literally was this place uh, where this relationship between creator and creature was lived out where this union of God and man uh, was played out in history. Um, and so we can simply say that the purpose of creation was this union of God and man. But we all know what happened, obviously, which brings us to our second point, that sin scattered that uh, uh, we, we highlighted this, the, the story of the Tower of Babel, where they said, let us make a name for ourselves and let us build a tower to the heavens. And we will be very similar to the, uh, the sin of Adam and Eve. We will be like gods. And so because of that sin, they were scattered. Namely, uh, their language was scattered. So the second point is that sin scatters the human race. Third, the entire Old Testament uh, is, can be summed up as the story of God trying 
to gather his people back. How does he do this? Namely, through covenants. And so throughout, throughout Old Testament history, he sends these mediators to establish covenants uh, to bring people back. So again, sin scatters, God gathers. That's the whole story of the Old Testament. Uh, uh, but we all know throughout the several, uh, the, the different covenants of the Old Testament, what continued to happen. Man continued to fall. Man continued to be unfaithful. But what? God always remained faithful to his promise. He always returned to his people. The same way uh, uh, as parents. Uh, uh, we, we will we'll always return to our kids and say, I forgive you. I forgive you. Over and over. And so that brings us to our fourth point where uh, God's ultimate uh, promise, his ultimate faithfulness is made incarnate in Jesus Christ. And so it is in Christ where we find the perfect unity of God and man. That Christ fulfills that mission which was established at creation to, to, to be a place where God and man were together. That is ultimately fulfilled in his very being, in the perfect unity of Christ. And so he fulfills the mission of the Father. He fulfills that mission of the Father in his very being. So, his very essence of who he is, perfectly God, perfectly man, united in harmony. Uh, and so, from that flows, like we had uh, quoted uh, John Paul II, that the mystery of the church is a continuation of the mystery of the incarnation. And so, the fifth and final point from, from last week, that this communion... of God and man is continued in the church. And in particular, the Eucharist. So, last week we highlighted this word right here, communion. That from, from that word comes kind of two things. You say the word communion, two things should come to your mind. What? A communion of people, but also the body of Christ. Holy communion, receiving holy communion. So, those two aspects of communion being a, a, a unity of people, but also the Eucharist. And the, the other term that we highlighted was the body of Christ. Again, St. Paul's theology, the body of Christ referring to the communion of people, but also when we go to Mass, the priest, the deacon, the extraordinary minister says the body of Christ, re referencing the Eucharist. So those two, uh, uh, those two things make the church. Uh, uh, the gathering of, of God's people and the Eucharist. And so, uh, it's rightly said that the church makes the Eucharist and the Eucharist makes the church. And so that summarizes all of last week. So we went through several uh, uh, beginning, uh, especially in the book of Acts, which we're going to cover tonight. So we're going to summarize that entire book because that book really gives us a continuation of the Gospels. So if you want to read, I w I, you know, if you want to sit down and just say, okay, I want to read the, the story of Jesus and, and how, how does it continue? Read Luke and Acts because they have the same author. And so uh, the, to summarize uh, the book of Acts, we have that first story of Pentecost, where, uh, which we pointed out was a reversal of the story of Babel. That 
uh, upon receiving the Holy Spirit, the disciples went out and they preached and everybody heard uh, the message, the gospel message, in their own tongue. They did not speak one language, but they spoke and everybody heard them in their own language. And so it shows not only the diversity, but also the unity. And so uh, uh, we see in that story that Peter is the one who preaches the gospel. We see the effects of the mission of Christ. So at the end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus gave the apostles that mission. He says, go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And then he gives them that promise. He says, and lo, I am with you always until the end of the age. So he, he sends them out. He gives them a mission and he says, I will be with you always until the end of the age. We can have faith in the words of Christ there. We see this immediately played out after Pentecost. Peter preaches. The people hear it. It says they're struck to the heart and they say, what must we do? Peter says, be baptized. It says that about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And so we see that mission that was given in Matthew is now lived out after Pentecost. This continues in, in uh, another particular story is the book of, in, in the book of Acts is Philip and the eunuch. Um, so there's a, a eunuch riding on a chariot. And uh, he's reading the, the, the gospel, or he's reading the, the, the stories of the Old Testament. And Philip asks him, you know, do you know what you're reading? And he says, how can I unless somebody helps me, unless somebody explains it to him? Philip explains all the Old Testament passages in fulfillment of Christ. And, and it, it, it kind of gives a, a pause in the story there. And then it, it says, the eunuch, upon seeing a, a, a body of water in the far off distance, says, what is to prevent uh, my being baptized? And so again, we see that story, we see that mission that was given in Matthew is lived out in the early church to go, to preach, to baptize, uh, and to have faith that Christ is with us. Uh, that's in Acts 8, 26 through 40, a great story. Um, we saw the conversion story of St. Paul in the book of Acts, where um, Saul is persecuting Christians. He's knocked to the ground. And Christ comes to him and says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And just in case Saul wasn't listening, he says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And so we have that uh, particular instance where Jesus identifies himself with his church. He does not say, why are you persecuting the Christians? Why are you persecuting those people who follow me, those people who believe in me? He says, why do you persecute me? And so we see this unique uh, 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 self-identification of Christ with his church. And so the book of Acts itself is, uh, uh, highlights uh, in so many different stories the kind of continuing of the primacy of, of Peter. Peter has a primary place in the book of Acts. Along with Peter in the book of Acts is St. Paul. And so those two figures uh, hold primary place in the book of Acts. Peter and Paul. And so a couple of different, uh, uh, before we get to, to this first handout, um, a couple of different uh, kind of a, a literary strategy that, that Luke employed was to, to draw kind of parallel uh, parallels between Peter and Paul. So I'll just point out uh, a couple of those. Um, and so we have St. Peter and St. Paul. So first, Luke highlights their preaching. And this is in Acts 2 and 3 and 13 for Paul. St. Luke highlights, highlights uh, healing. He highlights Peter's healing in, in Acts 5, 12 through 16, and Paul's ability to heal in Acts 19, verses 11 and 12. And an encounter with a sorcerer. For St. Peter, 
That is in Acts 8, 18 through 23. And for St. Paul, it's in Acts 13, 8 through 12. And this is uh, uh, particularly a, a great story. It's the, the story of, of Simon. So if you ever wondered where we got, if you've ever heard of the, the sin of simony, uh, it comes from this story. Uh, uh, Simon the sorcerer uh, says, you know, I've seen you guys do these amazing things. How much does it cost? And so uh, 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 Simon tries to buy, uh, uh, buy the Holy Spirit. Um, and and uh, uh, Peter rebukes him. We see uh, particularly highlighted uh, uh, Peter and Paul and their uh, calling upon the Holy Spirit, their interaction with the Holy Spirit. St. Peter in 8.17 and St. Paul in 9.6. And then lastly, the jail breaks. So, St. Peter in Acts 12, 6 through 17. And St. Paul, Acts 16, 16 through 34. And so, the book of Acts highlights. Uh, not only these two apostles of Peter and Paul, but it, but it puts them very much on a parallel. It puts them uh, uh, kind of uh, showing that they are on the same mission. Even though they kind of came from a couple of different paths, they are on that same mission. And so Luke uh, highlights that in this way. Now, a particular uh, thing to remember with the book of Acts. Acts begins in Jerusalem. But it doesn't end there. The book itself ends in Rome, when Paul makes it to Rome. And so uh, uh, that's kind of a, a small detail, but it's something that, that becomes very important um, when we talk about the church. What begins in Jerusalem ends in Rome. And so uh, that's all we're going to cover about the book of Acts um, tonight. Um, but before we kind of move on to the early church fathers, I do want to mention this handout. We're not going to go uh, particularly through it. Um, and it's a handout from there's a, a Ignatius Catholic Study Bible. It's a big blue book, and this is just the New Testament. Um, so it has very good um, articles such as this one. Uh, extensive footnotes and things like that. It's very good and most, uh, most especially for, especially for a commentary and a, like a, a study New Testament, it's very cheap. I think I got mine when it first came out for like 15 bucks, uh, which is ridiculous. Um, so I, I'm, I know it's probably a little more than that, but it's very, very inexpensive when you're talking about uh, uh, commentary um, on the whole New Testament. And so this is a, a, a one that summarizes it very well. Not only does it show the primacy of Peter in the Gospels, but also the primacy of Peter in the book of Acts and how they hold, he holds that, uh, uh, that place uh, of honor, that place of reverence. So, <clears throat> taking off from the book of Acts. So what began in Jerusalem ends in Rome. And so, when we talk about the early church fathers, we're talking about the, the period and the, the, the writings immediately after the Gospels. That even some of the, 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 the early church fathers, they were being written around the same time as the Gospels, as the, the, the letters of St. Paul. And so, uh, we're talking about con almost some of them contemporaries with the Apostles. And so what we're going to do, though, it, it may seem counterintuitive, but I hope you'll see kind of uh, the, the plan by the end, is we're going to, to pick out three uh, early church fathers, and we're going to work at them backwards. Um, so the first one we're going to begin with is St. Irenaeus. Um, and so uh, he's writing um, about the year uh, 177, so, uh, you know, mid to, to late second century. Um, and the handout, which I apologize for, the, the staple is on the wrong side, so it's a very counterintuitive document. 
So just in case the reading is not challenging enough, the, 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 the sheer logic of, 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 of going through it will, will exercise your, your mental capabilities. All for a reason. So uh, the, the part I chose here from, from uh, St. Irenaeus was a, uh, a part from his, it's book three of his uh, treatise on against heresies. And so again, uh, we're talking about the year 177. He was the Bishop of Lyon and uh, he has written, uh, se he wrote several different letters. This one against heresies is probably one of his most uh, uh, famous um, and it's probably the one that's quoted most often. And so I'm going to go ahead and pick out a, a few things. And like I said, there's, I believe there's, there's five books in this whole thing. This is just uh, a section of book three. And so, uh, but book three is particularly on the tradition of the Gospels and sacred tradition or apostolic tradition as he refers to it. And so, from the beginning of this book three, the highlighted section there. For we learn the plan of our salvation from no, from no others than from those whom the gospel came to us. They first preached it abroad, and then later, by the will of God, handed it down to us in writings to be the foundation and pillar of our faith. And so, he's talking about here those gospel messages, those witnesses to what happened to Christ, that they handed down that message to us, and eventually they put it into writing. He goes on to list four of them, which, of course, we still follow today, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so he highlights these within the tradition of the Gospels. And so, uh, you know, it's something we have to kind of keep in our mind, especially when we study this early part of the church, is that they did not have... Uh, uh, the, the beautiful tools that we have now, like the catechism or, you know, even uh, a table of contents in the Bible. You know, uh, we take that from granted sometimes, or even when we talk about the inspiration. Well, yes, all of Scripture is inspired. Well, what about the table of contents? It's a great question. Um, and so uh, the, the, the early church was not only uh, figuring out uh, how to evangelize, so they were given that mission. Go Preach the gospel message. Okay, well, who is Jesus? He's God, yes. But he was a man, yes. Okay, so is he fully God, fully man, half man, half God? And so there were all of these, uh, all of these uh, issues coming up of not necessarily what is the truth, but how do we express this truth? Kind of, you know, they, they had the diamond, they just had to find the right setting for it. Um, and so, uh, and in the middle of that, they were being just persecuted the entire time. So, uh, just to make matters even harder. And so, these early church writings are particularly important in giving us a glimpse into the world of that early church, uh, especially when the the apostles begin to die. Who's in charge? Where do we go? Where do we turn to? And so, uh, Irenaeus, Saint Ignatius. And, and St. Clement kind of give us uh, a, a great glimpse into that, what, what the early church did. And so continuing, the next section he goes about talking about the apostolic tradition. And he says, uh, to kind of define it, he says, that tradition which has come down from the apostles and is guarded by the succession of elders in the truth. Um, I'm sorry, in the churches. And so uh, he makes two points with that statement, that this, uh, this tradition comes down through the apostles and it is guarded through that succession. And so as that tradition is passed down, it is guarded. He continues, he says uh, at the bottom there, he says, the tradition of the apostles made clear in all the world can be clearly seen in every church by those who wish to behold the truth. We can enumerate those who were established by the apostles as bishops in the churches and their successors down to our time, none of whom taught or thought of anything like their mad ideas. So remember, this is being written in a book called Against Heresies. <laughs> so he's talking a lot of times about mad ideas or somebody's opinions. And so he says, he says, we can trace this. Not only is it guarded through that apostolic succession, but let's trace that to show you. <clears throat> uh, 
And so he kind of begins, he says, uh, by pointing out the tradition which that very, that very great oldest and well-known church founded and established at Rome by those two most glorious apostles, Peter and Paul, received from the apostles and its faith known among men, which comes down to us through the succession of bishops. So, he recognizes that this, it is the succession of the apostles. When he goes to explain that, St. Irenaeus chooses to, to start with Rome. He gives Rome kind of that primacy of place. And again, similar to the book of Acts, he says those two most glorious apostles, Peter and Paul. And so, again, that, the, that, that whole story of, of Peter uh, of, of Acts, what began in Jerusalem, ended in Rome, and highlights Peter and Paul as that unity. St. Irenaeus does the same here. Those two apostles and that well-known, that very great, that oldest church of Rome. He continues, For every church must be in harmony with this church. Because of its outstanding preeminence, that is, the faithful from everywhere, since the apostolic tradition is preserved in it by those from everywhere. When the blessed apostles had founded and built up the church, they handed over the, mystery, the ministry of the episcopate. And so here is where St. Irenaeus gives us that apostolic succession. And so he does so, again, from the church of Rome. To Linus. Paul mentions this in Linus in his epistles to Timothy. Anacletus succeeded him. After him, Clement received the lot of the episcopate in the third place from the apostles. And so uh, he then talks shortly about that, and then he continues. Verastus succeeded to this Clement, and Alexander to Verastus, and Sixtus was installed as the sixth from the apostles. And after Telesiphorus, who met a glorious martyrdom, and so on, and so on, and so on. He goes all the way to uh, Eleutherus, now in the twelfth place from the, from the apostles, uh, holds the lot of the episcopate. So he traces all the way back to the apostles to where he is today. The thing with the Catholic Church is that we can point to any priest, to any deacon, to any bishop, and we can do the same thing. We can trace them back to Jesus Christ. We can say, uh, uh, Father Braun. Father Braun was made a priest by Bishop Carada. Bishop Carada was made a bishop by this other bishop. This bishop was made a bishop by this bishop, by this pope, by this pope. 264 popes down the line to St. Peter to Christ establishing the Twelve Apostles. We can do the same thing today that St. Irenaeus is doing in the second century. Why is this important? Well, I think the easiest way to understand why this, this continuity is important, um, all we have to do is ask a lamp. Why is continuity important? So you have a lamp. You have a source of energy. It does not matter how close you get the plug to, uh, you get the plug to the actual source of the, the energy. It doesn't matter how close you get to it. If it's not plugged in, there is no light. And so this, this question of continuity is very important. Um, and so it becomes, like St. Irenaeus says, this apostolic succession is what guards the church. So he continues, <clears throat> not to repeat myself, but so the apostolic tradition is preserved in the church and has come down to us. Let us turn then to the demonstration from the writings of those apostles who recorded the gospel in which they recorded their conviction about God, showing that our Lord Jesus Christ is the truth. And so what is, what is interesting about St. Irenaeus that we, that we don't do today is that St. Irenaeus puts these two things together. Because remember for him, there's no real Old Testament, New Testament. There is the Old Testament, and there is the apostolic tradition, which includes the writings of the apostles. And so, when he talks about this apostolic tradition, he says, 
Let us then turn then to the demonstration from the writings. And so he says, what has been handed, on, handed down to us in tradition, they made known in the writings. And so we don't have kind of that, that, that dichotomy that is sometimes uh, drawn very clearly between uh, 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 sacred scripture and sacred tradition. And so, again, he's writing against heresies, and so he says, uh, Ignorance, the mother of these things, is driven out by knowing the truth. Therefore, the Lord imparted knowledge of the truth to his disciples. Again, this is passed down to us. And this last point on page 374 that he makes um, about halfway down the highlighted part there. He says, Even if the apostles had not left their writings to us, ought we not to follow the rule of tradition which they handed down to those to whom they committed to the churches? And so, St. Irenaeus has this beautiful treatise on, uh, and this is just one aspect of his writing, uh, on the, the, the necessity of this apostolic succession, of this continuity between the Bishop of Rome and Jesus Christ himself. That we can trace this, this apostolic succession back to Christ himself. And a particular quote, I don't think it's in that part, it's, it's earlier in uh, Against Heresies. He says, That real church has one and the same faith everywhere in the world. That from the very beginning of the church, there was this beautiful unity. That they, they, they saw uh, God's plan uh, 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 being fulfilled in Christ to bring people back in communion with each other. Like we saw in the book of Acts in 2.42 where he says the, 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 the early Christians, they devoted themselves uh, uh, to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and the prayers. This, this unity is founded not only on, uh, and, and we can look there even at, at, at uh, Luke's words, uh, the apostles' teaching, what St. Irenaeus calls their writings, and fellowship. Not just any fellowship, but the Apostles' Fellowship. That succession. That uh, this, this unity that was, was, that was brought in Christ's very person is then made evident in the church. Is it hard to see sometimes? Absolutely. Um, um, but we can, be, we can be assured that it is there uh, for a couple of reasons. First, Christ's promise. I will be with you always until the end of the age. Again, and then in uh, Matthew 16, he says, The gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against you. And then lastly, so not only that promise of Christ, how do we see that promise of Christ? Through that apostolic succession. Like that lamp, that continuity is important. That continuity is important. And we know that the church has had uh, all sorts of, of, of different things happen through its history, which we'll cover next week. So, you know, how do we deal with those things like, you know, all of those bad popes and things like that? How, do we, how does that play into all of this? And so we'll cover a lot of that next week. So, again, the second century, St. Irenaeus. And this is a very explicit, explicit uh, writing of uh, the church's understanding of herself. So, let's go f uh, even further back uh, than the year 177 to St. Ignatius of Antioch. Um, he appears around, around the year 100. Um, he writes uh, many different letters. Um, his are some of, the, uh, some of the oldest ones that we have preserved. And he is mainly concerned with unity. Um, so again, that same thing that we picked up, uh, St. Ignatius is concerned with unity. And so,
before I go before I go through them, a quick note. Many of Saint Ignatius' uh, little letters, they are literally three, maybe some, maybe some of them are four pages. Very short. Um, you can find them online for free. Uh, the Catholic Encyclopedia. Just type in uh, uh, Ignatius of Antioch and it'll list uh, the letters that he wrote there and you can click on each of them. Um, uh, like I said, he wrote, he wrote many of them um, and uh, they're all chocked full of little, uh, little things. And so, And so a particular thing that we want to kind of trace from, from Irenaeus to Ignatius and then in a second to Clement is not just, uh, which we already talked about, that primacy of Peter, but also simply the primacy of Rome. That Rome had a particular place from the beginning. Irenaeus calls it that oldest church. And he doesn't just say that it was uh, there from, from, from Peter, but he puts those two apostles together, Peter and Paul. And so you'll always see those apostles together. You know, we even have a chapel of Saints Peter and Paul. Uh, uh, Peter being recognized as that apostle to the Jews and Saint Paul, that great apostle to the Gentiles. And so uh, both of them point not only uh, uh, to the building up of that unity uh, in the church, but also uh, point particularly to the primacy of Rome. And so, uh, St. Ignatius, in his uh, uh, epistle uh, to the Romans, so he is writing to Rome, he, in, his, in his greeting, so he's greeting this, this church in Rome, he says, The church which is beloved and enlightened by the will of him that wills all things, which are according to the love of Jesus Christ, our God, which also presides in this place of the region of the Romans, worthy of God, worthy of honor, worthy of the highest happiness, worthy of praise, worthy of obtaining her every desire, worthy of being deemed holy, and which presides over love, is named from Christ and from the Father, which I also salute in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. And then he gives a little brief kind of, as he goes into it, he says, to those who are united. And then he goes on to deliver uh, 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 this epistle to the Romans. And so, uh, again, St. Ignatius is very focused on unity. And so just from that short greeting as he's writing to uh, uh, the Romans, he, he points out and highlights the importance of Rome, the importance of that city. And so, uh, a couple of more things that, that, that are interesting in the, the epistles of, of Ignatius. <clears throat> one is that he is the first one to use the term Catholic. So, where do we get kind of that name, the, the Catholic Church? Namely, from St. Ignatius. And one, one other thing I do want to point out, again, remember, when, we read the, when you read these letters, if you go home, like I said, they're very short, they're very fun to read, fun, well, it's, it's relative, but I enjoy reading them. But uh, uh, is to, to try to put try to put your mindset in the time that they were written, in the time that uh, 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 the context of everything that was surrounding them, not just like the the persecution, but uh, what was the climate like within the church? You know, so uh, very different than 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 you know the East Texas, you know, where you have. You know, forty thousand denominations. You know, just in South Tyler. You know, um, but you know, there's not. You know, just you know, all these different denominations and things. You're talking about the year 100. There was no great division in the church. There were simply Christians. There was there there was not uh, uh, people going around saying, oh, you know, those Catholics over there with their Eucharist and these, you know, these people. There was none of that. There was, there was Christians. And so, uh, two things can be noted is, A, keep that in mind. There's no big division. There's, there's simply a united church. However, we, during this time, we do have to have, uh, and I may have to edit this out, we have to have some particular mercy 
on the, the, the heretics during this time. Um, because, uh, yes, mercy for heretics. Um, because they did not have things like the catechism where they could say, well, you know, is that what the, uh, what the church teaches? They didn't have the, you know, an official document to go through. They, they, they went to the church herself and said, how do we talk about Christ? How do we talk about the Holy Trinity? If somebody asked me what I, be what I believe, what should I say? And so they said, let's go to the Apostles' teaching. I believe in God the Father Almighty and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. And so you had things like the Creed. They held a particular uh, an important part of that. And we'll see those creeds get later developed as, as the church develops her language and her understanding, as the doctrine itself develops. The doctrine is not invented. The doctrine is not uh, 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 just c coming out of nowhere, but it develops. It grows. Like that person of Christ who, who came in the form of an infant, he grew and died for us in the same way that doctrine develops. And if you want to read about that, read Cardinal Newman. He has a great uh, um, uh, essay on the development of doctrine. <clears throat> and so, uh, this is St. Ignatius, using the term Catholic for the first time. And so he's writing, again, remember, he's, he's focused on unity, and this one he's writing to the Smyrnians. I didn't make that up. See that you all follow the bishop, even as Jesus Christ does the Father and the presbytery as you would the apostles. Let no man do anything connected with the church without the bishop. Let that be deemed a proper Eucharist, which is, either admini which is administered either by the bishop or by one to whom he has entrusted it. Wherever the bishop shall appear, there let all the people also be. Wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. And so, two things uh, uh, stand out. Um, first, that union of that last statement. Where Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. How do we understand that? Again, go back to St. Paul, the body of Christ. That the Church makes up uh, uh, Christ's body. So much to the point to where Christ himself identifies the church with himself. Second, uh, uh, Sorry. Yeah. this is uh, St. Ignatius' letter to the Smyrnians, number 8, or chapter 8, but it's, you know, like I said, they're very short chapters here. So, letter to the Smyrnians, 8. And so, uh, the other point that he makes there is, is that, un that union, that unity, is not simply a, a spiritual communion uh, uh, like many Christian denominations have when they talk about the church. So it's, this, it's a spiritual union. Uh, St. Ignatius is pointing that this is a real union. Where the bishop is, there let the people be. So, how do we know that this, this priest or this bishop is in line there? Well, he says, let that be deemed a proper Eucharist. And so he, he points to not only the bishop, but he says the Eucharist. That also is going to be uh, 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 the, 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 the characteristic of your unity. That it is going to be that, that sign of your unity. Remember that those, those terms, communion, can refer to both the people and the Eucharist. And the body of Christ can again be referred to both the unity of the people and the Eucharist. And so that's St. Ignatius's letter to the Smyrnians number, number 8. And then, let's see, I thought I had one more. Yes. So this is uh, taken from uh, the Epistle of Ignatius to the Philadelphians, not the United States. And so, I mean, you can just go go through and read the the kind of the the headlines here. Again, Saint Ignatius is focused on uh, unity. And so. Uh, in the, the beginning of this, he says, Wherefore, as children of light and truth, flee from division and wicked doctrines, 
But where the shepherd is, there follow his sheep. For there are many wolves that appear worthy of credit. And so, uh, but he says, um, that are running towards God, but in your unity they shall have no peace. And so, St. Ignatius, uh, again, uh, he's, he's writing to all these different churches, and he's saying, He's saying uh, they're, they're now, and, and you have to remember the, the, this, this, the, the particular time of the church is around 100. And so you're talking about the apostles are now dead. That direct link to Jesus is now gone from us. And so you can imagine kind of the, the, the state of things if, you know, that, you know, if, you know, Bishop Strickland was gone and then all the priests were gone. We, all right, well, you know, who's in charge? You know, where do, where do we go? Where do we go? Well, we go to those that are entrusted, that have been entrusted by those apostles. We trace that back. That's ap apostolic succession. And so during this time in the early church, there were those that were, were saying, well, the apostles are gone. Let's just kind of go do what we want. And the bishops are saying, no. The, 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 the early church fathers are saying, no. Go to where we can trace that apostolic succession. That's where you'll find your unity. That's where you'll find that true Eucharist because you also have a, a particular thing that was floating around this time was the, the Gnosticism, which was saying, well, yes, Christ you know, told, uh, told the apostles this, but we have this uh, secret knowledge. We have this, this knowledge that uh, it's, you know, kind of secretive about it, but you know, once you join us, then we'll let you know that this, this secret knowledge that Christ did not reveal to the apostles, but to us. Uh, and so you had these people playing, uh, uh, kind of trying to draw people away from the church. And so Ignatius and Irenaeus and all of these early church fathers are writing and saying, no, stay with that unity. How do we see that unity? In the bishops and in the Eucharist. And so, in this same letter to the uh, Philadelphians, he says, for as, many, for as many as are of God and of Jesus Christ, they are also with the bishop. If any man follows him that makes a schism, so a, a separation, if any man follows him that makes a schism in the church, he shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If anyone walks according to that strange opinion, he agrees not with the passion of Christ. Um, so pretty strong language there. And again, when we think, when we go back to, to last week's class, the whole purpose of God in creation was to establish a place of unity. Where, where, where sin, when sin came into the world, it began to scatter the people. It began to cause divisions. Christ came, he founded this church, uh, he identifies himself with this church. He gave himself in the Eucharist to this church. And so, uh, but he did not, and, and this is important to remember, but he didn't just abolish sin when he did that. He left us with our free will. And so, with that free will, we can exercise it. And so that sin still remains. And so, even though that church is still here, so is that sin. And where there is sin, there is division. And so we see that story again being played out in the church. There, there are those that are, 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 are being scattered. There are those that are causing division. Uh, uh, Irenaeus, uh, Ignatius, these great saints that we have, they, they spent their whole life trying to, to, to build this unity, trying to keep this unity uh, uh, that Christ established in the church. And so, immediately after he exhorts them, he says, uh, stay with the bishop. That is where you'll find it. He says, if any of you make a schism, you shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And immediately after he talks about uh, 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 remaining in union with the bishop, he talks about the Eucharist. And he says, take heed then to have but one Eucharist. For there is one flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ in one cup to the unity of his blood, one altar as there is one bishop, along with presbytery and deacons and his fellow servants. That so whatsoever you do, you may do it according to the will of God. And so in that little sentence, he, he 
establishes a lot there. He says, there is one Eucharist. How do we know that? Because there is one bishop, along with the presbytery and the deacons. And so he points there to, he points there to our kind of three degrees of the, the hierarchy of the church. Uh, going again, going all the way back to the year 100, giving evidence for that already being played out in the church. But he points most especially to the Eucharist. In chapter 7, again to the Philadelphians, he says, But the Spirit proclaimed these words Do nothing without the bishop, keep your bodies as the temple of God, love unity, avoid division, be the followers of Jesus Christ even as he is of his father. And so, and it's one of those things, when you read, what I love about St. Ignatius' letters is uh, uh, they, they really are letters. They're not, you know, uh, it's not the Summa, you know. It's not somebody saying, okay, now we're going to, I'm going to go through the Trinity. So we're going to talk about, you know, the, you know, three persons, one God, two natures, one Christ, not a monophysite, you know, the, you know, going through all these, it's not a, a systematic presentation of, you know, here's the church, a nice and neat, you know, and, and, uh, 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 you know, neat lists and things like that. He's writing a letter. So, so he's writing to uh, 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 he has a group in mind. He has a group of people in mind. And so you, when you read his letters, they're, they're, they're filled with kind of this, this kind of expectant joy and this, this, this loving, uh, very fittingly, fatherly kind of care uh, to his people. And so um, a, a particular uh, part in, in his letter to the Philadelphians, which I love, is that he goes back to the Old Testament. Um, and... Uh, and a particular reason why he does that is around this time or, or shortly thereafter, there was a, a, a heretic named Marcion who said uh, he was a, a dualist uh, uh, heretic. So if you remember the dualists from, from Ben's classes and some of the others, they believe that you know, the, the spirit good, the body bad. Um, that they, there was this, the, some of them even believed in the, the good God and the bad God. And so same with scripture, that the Old Testament was bad, the New Testament good. And so now that we have the New Testament, now we have these writings, we can do away with the Old. And so Marcion wanted to get rid of all of the Old Testament. And so uh, St. Ignatius, uh, writing about the Old Testament, um, he says, uh, The priests indeed are good, but the high priest is better, to whom the Holy of Holies has been committed. And who, are, who, and who alone has been entrusted with the secrets of God. He is the door of the Father, by which enter in Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the prophets and the apostles and the church. All these have, have, all these have for their object the attaining to the unity of God. And so I, I love how he puts the apostles in the church within kind of that, that litany of, of the great fathers that went before us that established those covenants. Again, God's plan trying to draw his people together. He did that in the covenants. And St. Ignatius here puts, puts that all into to beautiful lineage for us to see, you know, to, to kind of, again, give us that big picture of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the prophets, the apostles, and the church. All these have for their object the attaining of what? The unity of God. And so we see here another beautiful example of, of, of that uh, continuance of the church striving for unity. And if you want kind of the, 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 the cheat sheet uh, I found on uh, the Catholic Encyclopedia, when you go to the, 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 the page on St. Ignatius, it gives you a, kind of a laundry list of... Uh, uh, among the many Catholic doctrines to be found in the letters, here they are. And then it goes through and it lists uh, many of the doctrines that St. Ignatius brings up, um, some of those of which I have just pointed out. Um, but it does not, again, it's not exhaustive at all. There's many more things that St. Ignatius brings up. Again, you're talking about the year 100. You're talking about, uh, you know, uh, shortly after the death of the last apostle. And so, um, St. Ignatius striving for unity around the year 100. So, we have, in, in Irenaeus, we had that very explicit 
uh, uh, apostolic tradition, the, the very explicit treatise on apostolic tradition. Saint Ignatius still pointing to that. Um, but to end, we're going to we're going to go back to Saint Clement. Saint Clement is the the, the, the earliest writing that we have. Um, that uh, uh, that if you go to many early church fathers, Saint Clement's usually the first. And it's the the earliest one we have. And he's listed when we went through uh, uh, Irenaeus' uh, succession of, of the bishops of Rome, so of the popes. Uh, Clement, it said after the apostles, there was, you know, third from the apostles was Clement. So Clement being the fourth bishop of Rome. So, and you'll hear him in Mass where they say, Linus, Cletus, Clement. Um, he is that fourth pope. Again, one of the earliest, or the earliest writing that we have. So he's writing around the year shortly before Ignatius in the, the 90s. And so what we can find in Clement is, is very much a, a, a kind of the things that we've just pointed out explicitly, we can find those things implicitly. And why is that important? Well, if we, if we can find these things implicitly, there has to be a premise uh, uh, to Clement saying those things, that the reality has to be there in order for Clement to say these things. So, uh, for example, if uh, um, uh, President Obama comes and, and gives a, a, a speech or something like that, before every speech he doesn't say, okay, I am President Obama, I am the, whatever, the 40th something, I should know that, right? The, the, the 40th something president, you know, you can trace me back to George Washington. I have authority given to me, uh, you know, uh, um, by the executive branch. You know, like, he does not establish his authority in there. But what? In his, in his, in his uh, speeches, in his things, his actions, he acts from that authority. He speaks from that authority. And so when we look at the things he does, we could say he does that as the President of the United States. And so in that same... Definitely not in the same uh, analogy, but uh, kind of in that same uh, understanding, we can look at Clement, that fourth pope. Uh, uh, he, he acts, uh, uh, like I said, um, we, those things, uh, he acts from that authority. And so there's little, I love it because there's you know, little clues that can easily be skipped over, but uh, uh, we're going to highlight them uh, just to... Uh, uh, just to enhance our study here. So, uh, in uh, Pope Clement, he writes, uh, he says, uh, he begins this letter. He says, uh, Dear friends, uh, due to the sudden and successive misfortunes and accidents we have encountered, we have, we admit, been rather long in turning our attention to your quarrels. So that's how he begins his letter. And you may say, well, that doesn't really tell us anything about apostolic tradition. Um, but what, is it, what does that tell us? So the letter that Clement's writing is to the church in Corinth. And so you have here uh, uh, a bishop of Rome writing to a church in Corinth. <clears throat> However, it is a church in Corinth. They are separated by language, by culture, and about 500 miles. Corinth was one of the first churches set up. We, have that, we know that because the letters of St. Paul, he writes to the Corinthians. So it is understood that they probably have their own bishop. But here we have the bishop of Rome writing to the church in Corinth. That we have uh, a bishop from one kind of interceding to another one. And not only that, but listen to, again, the way that he begins this letter. He says, due to the sudden and successive misfortunes and accidents we have encountered, we have, we admit, been rather long in turning our attention to your quarrels. What does that imply? That Rome had an, an, an interest that Rome had the obligation to step in to address these quarrels that were happening in Corinth. And so he begins this letter with an apology. He says, you know, sorry guys, uh, you know, uh, you know um, I've, been, I've been busy with you know, all these other churches, but I'm getting to you now. 
he had uh, he had that understanding that uh, 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 that I need to write these people. That it is part of my duty as the Bishop of Rome that when I see quarrels in other churches that I intercede, that I write letters to them. So uh, it kind of just gives us, again, gives us a clue into that. <clears throat> so he, he sees it as his duty to, to address the church in Corinth. <clears throat> it certainly points to Rome, again, as having some authority over some of the other churches. And continuing, so continuing in Clement's letter, he writes of the examples of the saints who have gone before the Christians. And so he says, Let us set before our eyes the illustrious apostles. Peter, through the unrighteous envy, endured not one or two, but numerous labors. And, we had, and when he had at length suffered martyrdom, departed to the place of glory due to him. Owing to envy, Paul also obtained the reward of patient endurance. After being seven times thrown into captivity, compelled to flee, and stoned. After preaching both in the east and the west, he gained the illustrious reputation due to his faith, having taught the righteousness to the whole world, and come to the extreme limit of the west, and suffered martyrdom under the prefects. Thus was he removed from the world and went into the holy place, having proved himself a striking example of patience. And so, of all the saints, of all the different people, of even the previous popes that Clement could point to, or even maybe some of the people in Corinth, he points out who? Peter and Paul. And so we saw that again, uh, kind of uh, in Irenaeus' letter, he talks about that uh, when he writes to the Church of Rome. Not only is this kind of the primary place, but it is primary uh, uh, because of Peter and Paul. And so again, what began in Jerusalem ends in Rome and continues with Peter and Paul. And so uh, uh, the Sea of Rome is where uh, kind of the church is now drawn together. Having, and, and it's because both Peter and Paul were martyred there. The Rome shares, uh, kind of uh, as uh, Tertullian said, you know, the, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the faith. And so you have this place where the two most glorious apostles uh, uh, were martyred. There becomes that new place of unity, the Sea of Rome. And so being head of that sea, St. Clement, now understands his duty to write the other churches. He understands that it's his obligation, and he, he begins that letter again with the apology, I'm sorry it took so long, but let us address these issues. <clears throat> and so Clement next gives an indication of where to find the answer to the problems which the Corinthians were facing. He says, We are writing in this vein, dear friends, not only to admonish you, but also to remind ourselves. And so it's a very interesting kind of way that, that uh, Clement is, is saying in that, that he understands that his letter's not just going to the Corinthians, that it's meant for more. And so again, he says, we are writing in this vein, dear friends, not only to admonish you, but to remind ourselves. So yes, his letter is going to the church in, in Corinth, but he also understands that other churches will read it. And so he puts, he puts the line in there that it, it's also a charge to uh, um, uh, remind ourselves. Continuing, he writes, For we are in the same arena and involved in the same struggle. Hence we should give up empty and futile concerns and turn to the glorious and holy rule of our tradition. And so his answer to the problems in Corinth, to, to the divisive problems that were happening there, he says what? He says, go back to the tradition. He says, turn to the glorious and holy rule of our tradition. And so if we go back again to the, the, the Acts of the Apostles in 242, they devoted themselves to the teaching of the Apostles and the fellowship and the breaking of the bread and the prayers. And so... Uh, Clement's answer to, to not only the, the, the problems in the church in Corinth, but to anybody else that's reading that, is to turn back to the tradition. St. Ignatius, his is the same way. And he says, how do you know that tradition? 
because now you have these other people claiming other things. How do you know that tradition? By the bishop. Where the bishop is, there is the Catholic Church. And so uh, he, he exhorts them to, to, to turn back to this. <clears throat> he also explains that like the body in the church, there are many different parts, each having a different role. He writes, the apostles have received the gospel for us from our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus the Christ was sent from God, thus Christ is from God, and the apostles from Christ. It is disgraceful, exceedingly disgraceful and, other, and unworthy of your Christian upbringing to have it reported that because of one or two individuals, the solid and ancient Corinthian church is in revolt against its presbyters. And so, uh, I know that's kind of a long quote, but he says, it is unworthy of your Christian upbringing uh, that it's been reported to him. So again, you have Clement saying that a report has been given to me about this church way over here and, and, and you know, 500 miles away. There was a report given to Rome about another church. Another aspect, he says, unworthy of your Christian upbringing to, to, to be in revolt against your presbyters. So, this Christian upbringing, what would that, what would that look like? What would that be? Uh, again, go back to Acts 2.42, I think. I think we can turn there again. What establishes that Christian upbringing, the apostles' teaching and fellowship? And by fellowship, we can mean many things. We can mean the fellowship of the apostles. So those that received from the apostles, the apostles handed down to other presbyters. And so he points out those two things, that, that Christian upbringing involves not revolting against your priests, not revolting against your bishop, bishops. Um, And also he makes that connection again between Christ and the Apostles. And so to end, Clement ends his letter in a very interesting manner. He writes, We are sending you, moreover, trustworthy and discreet persons who from youth to old age have lived irreproachable lives among us. They will be witnesses to mediate between us. We have done this to let you know that our whole concern has been and is to have peace speedily restored among you. So, not only is the letter from, from Clement to the Corinthians, not only is it the Bishop of Rome interceding for a church 500 miles away and just writing a letter saying, here's what you need to do, turn back to the tradition which has been given to you, Christ to the apostles, the apostles to the presbyters. But he's saying, we are going a step farther. He's saying, I am sending you two people uh, they will be witnesses to mediate between us. We have done this to let you know that our whole concern has been to restore peace. Again, to restore unity. And so, not only are they, 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 is Rome interceding for these problems, but they are sending people to help the, the church in Corinth. And so, in this, in the, going again, back further from Irenaeus, back further from Ignatius, we can see uh, Clement, the fourth pope, acting with this authority, interceding and, and playing that part that Ignatius and Irenaeus make more and more explicit. We can see that implicitly in the way that uh, uh, St. Clement writes in the way that he intercedes for these other churches. So, with that we have gone to the year 200. So, um, next time we will cover the, the, the next 1800 years. <laughs> quickly. <laughs> Very quickly. Uh, any questions? I know that was a whole lot, but again, uh, you can uh, go to the Catholic Encyclopedia. Many, especially Ignatius's letters, they're, they're simple to read, they're short, two or three pages, uh, uh, and they're beautiful. There's so much contained in there. And again, remember, you're reading letters from a time where there was no real division in, church, in the church, where you did not have uh, 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 big divisions in the church. You had these, these small little problems that the church was suffering from, that we still suffer from. Um, and, and so we can kind of go back and, and enter into that time of history and see 
you know, what our church was like. And the beautiful thing is that, you know, like that lamp, you know, we're just kind of following the cord, you know, back to the power source. We can, we can trace the, the, the problems we have now, but also the things we have now, like the Eucharist, the, the, the apostolic succession. We can trace those things, again, all the way back to that early church, before there was no division, before there was unity and, and, and a lot... Uh